Patrick Kleibert was born in Amsterdam on 1st of July 1976, intriguingly enough, the exact same day as Rudvan Nistelrooy. His father Kenneth is from Suriname and his mother Ludwina is from Curaçao. Kenneth Kleibert was himself a professional footballer, making 345 appearances and scoring 366 goals from the left wing for Suriname's top flight side SV Robin Hood. Patrick's own footballing education started out on the streets of Amsterdam, where he would spend all his free time having kickabouts with his friends from the neighbourhood, which included one Edgar Davids. Young Clivert idolised Dutch icon Marco van Basten and dreamt of being like him. When I was young, I watched games on television and Marco van Basten was my idol. He scored so many goals and his style of play attracted me. I was a striker too, so it was natural to try and learn from him. Famed Ajax scout Tony Slot spotted the seven-year-old Clivert playing for local club Schellingwalde and, impressed by the youngster's goal-scoring exploits, welcomed him into the legendary Ajax Academy. In keeping with their total football philosophy, the rules stated that every young player in the academy must have experience playing in every position. So, Clivert had stints in defence and midfield before moving up to the final third of the pitch where he would make his name. The coaches there had a special way of assessing the talent, judging them by the TIPS system. Players would be marked on their technique, footballing intelligence, speed and personality. Clivert scored very highly on the first three, but there were some question marks raised over his impulsivity and tendency to receive cards which could have been avoided. This period was a true golden generation for Ajax, as a lot of supreme talents and future footballing legends were graduating from the academy and making their first team debuts. Edwin van der Sar and Edgar Davids were a bit older, so they made the breakthrough first. Kalanit Seydorf, Mario Melchiot and Kleivert were all born in the same year, and Patrick was the second to make his first team bow. He would be joining other young talents like Nkwano Kanu, Vanidi George, Ronald and Frank de Boer, Mark Overmars and Yari Lipmanin, as well as more experienced campaigners like Frank Rijkaard and Danny Blind, meaning the Ajax first team had a formidable mix of youth and experience, with the balance tilted more towards youth. Then Ajax manager Louis van Gaal is a man that Clivert credits with having a big influence over his career, and he wasn't afraid to hand starts to youth prospects if he thought they were good enough. Hot Brazilian talent Ronaldo Nazario decided to join rivals PSV from Cruzeiro, which Van Gaal responded to by stating, they have Ronaldo and we have Clivert. This was a very strong show of confidence for a young striker. Patrick spoke about this in a recent interview with 90 Minutes. That was a time where PSV signed Ronaldo and Ajax didn't really have a follow up. He bragged, but actually, he put me under a little bit of pressure that I was the equivalent to Ajax. Ronaldo was the big talent in Brazil who went to PSV, and I was just a little boy who came from the youth, so I'm very happy he had the guts to present me to the first team. I am thankful for that. He had the guts to give him his debut in the Dutch Super Cup against Feyenoord. In the 25th minute, the tall skinny teenager broke into the box and prodded home Fanidi George's lovely cross to net Ajax's third and his first ever for the club. It was a goal which showcased many of the abilities which would make him a world class finisher, the intelligence to pick the right run, and the agility, pace, movement and skill to execute it. His celebration showcased that he was still just a teenager, as he struggled to work out how best to express his emotions in that moment. Not surprisingly, Clivert did not manage to outscore Ronaldo, as the Brazilian phenom scored 30 league goals to the young Dutch strikers 18. Dig a little deeper on those numbers and we find out that Clivert made just 25 league appearances, 16 of which were starts, culminating in 1,505 minutes on the field, which equates to a goal every 84 minutes. An outstanding return from his first senior campaign as Dutch defences struggled to live with the pace, predatory instincts and powerful finishing of Ajax's wonderkid striker. Clivert's goals helped fire Ajax to their second Dutch title in a row, this one obtained without losing a single match. On their run to the Champions League final against AC Milan, Ajax had already beaten the Rosonieri twice in the group stage and had dispatched Bayern Munich 5-2 in a thrilling semi-final second leg at the Olympiastadion. Clivert had not been prolific in Europe that season, scoring only one goal, a left-footed winner against Athens. So he started the final on the bench with Yari Lipmanin preferred up front. His 69 minutes on the sideline gave him the perfect opportunity to observe and identify weaknesses in the seemingly unbreachable defence which included Paolo Maldini and Franco Baresi. Having failed to find an opening, Clivert replaced Lipmanin in the 70th 
45th minute. 15 minutes later, after some patient build up play, Rijkaard looked to set up the 1 2 with Clivert, but the 18 year old, who had miraculously escaped the attention of Baresi, shrugged off the desperate challenge of Boban and poked the ball home. His goal celebration was brilliant. As he wheeled away in delirium, he turned his shirt around so the back was facing the front and so that all of Europe could read his name. He broke down in tears at the end of the game and was full of emotion when he lifted aloft the biggest prize in club football, all big ears. The following season, both Ajax and Clivert continued to impress their way to success with their terrific total football, claiming their third consecutive Dutch title. He started the season well, again proving what a cool head sat on those young shoulders, stroking home a 102nd minute penalty to Darren Feyenoord in the Dutch Super Cup. He did not score as many goals as the previous season, getting 15 in the league. But his great all-round centre forward play, like coming deep to steal the ball and make things happen, or using his strength to hold up the ball and play his teammates through own goal, or flick the ball on with his head, started to bear fruit as he assisted 7 league goals that season. Ajax would win the European Super Cup and Clybert was scoring the first leg against Zaragoza, they also claimed the Intercontinental Cup against Gremio. He scored more consistently throughout the Champions League as well, bagging five en route to another final, this time against Juventus. Frankly, it's somewhat hard to believe that Clivert managed to play so well and score as many goals as he did. At the start of the season, in September 1995, Patrick Clivert was involved in a life-altering road accident as he crashed his friend's BMW into a Ford Orion, killing the driver, 56-year-old Theodore director and Ajax fan Martin Putman. Clivert was not drunk but was found to be driving well in excess of the speed limit, travelling at an estimated 104 km an hour in a 50 km an hour residential zone and sentenced to 240 hours community service. Just a matter of weeks after becoming a legend against Milan, Clivert was public enemy number one as he explained in an interview with the Mirror at the end of the season. The whole thing has done a lot of damage to me. One minute I was the idol of the public, the hero of Dutch football and the next Next minute, they slaughtered me because of what I had done. Weeks and months after the accident, I was still an emotional wreck. I think about the accident every day. It is always on my mind now. When I returned from injury for Ajax, my life was unbearable. People shouted terrible abuse at me from the stands, and they still do now. Despite being the favourites, holders Ajax would go on to lose the Champions League final to Juventus on penalties. Due to injury concerns, Clivert was not fully fit to start, only being deemed healthy enough to make a substitute appearance. There has been some major control obviously surrounding this final since though, as nearly 10 years after this, the old lady were involved in a doping scandal, as it emerged that many of their players were allegedly stuffed full of performance enhancing drugs during this period. UEFA briefly flirted with the idea of stripping the old lady of their title and handing it to Ajax, but in the end decided against this. Although still nursing his injury, Clivert was called up to the national team for Euro 96, but would start on the bench for all their group stage games, managing to score his only goal of the tournament, a consolation in the 4-1 thrashing by host England. He started the quarters against France, but they would be sent home on penalties. The various scandals and injuries would take their toll on Clivert, who had a final season to forget with Ajax, making 17 league appearances and scoring only 6 goals, drawing criticism from some of his teammates as well as being a frequent subject of of the media's distaste which led to constant whistles, boos and abuse from the fans. Due to the issues he was facing in his home country, Clivert rejected the offer of a contract extension from Ajax and he joined AC Milan on a Bosman in the summer. He made an encouraging start to life in Italy, netting a stonking strike against Juventus in the Trofeo Luigi Berlusconi, the Italian equivalent of the Community Shield. Things would go quickly downhill for both Clivert and Milan as he struggled to make the expected impact, netting just six times in the league. The fans, who had been expecting boatloads of goals from the Dutch wonder kid, didn't give their new signing any time to adjust and turned on him when those goals did not start to flow, and they booed him virtually every match. He didn't click with striking partner George Weah, as the two were often on different wavelengths and it was clear that he was a striker lacking confidence. The Rosanieri as a whole endured an underwhelming campaign as they toiled to a 10th place finish. There was still plenty of faith in him at international level though, as evidenced by his call up for France 98. It must have seemed like that faith had been misplaced, as after flattering through the seed in the opening match against Belgium, Clivert was sent off for lashing out with an elbow into the torso of Stollens. It was very soft and the Belgian absolutely sold it, making a meal out of it, but it was an unnecessary reaction from Clivert. He was suspended for the next three matches and had to watch as the Netherlands made it to the quarters without him. He immediately set about making amends for his indiscretion, finishing off a masterful move and excellent flick on off the head of Burkamp 
Camp to fire the Clockwork Orange in front after 12 minutes against Argentina. The aforementioned Bergkamp would hit an 89th minute winner to secure safe passage through the semis with a 2-1 win. Clivert was at it again in that match, powerfully heading home to level the game against Brazil in the 87th minute. Extra time wasn't enough to separate the two teams and they were sent home after penalties. Clivert's former manager and mentor had swapped Amsterdam for Spain and was now Barcelona boss. Having witnessed his protege struggles on the continent with Milan, he decided that the time was right to take the 22-year-old back under his wing and brought him to the new camp right on the death of transfer deadline day. Van Hal was turning Barcelona into a mini Holland, as Philip Koku and Bodoin Zenden earlier in that window, joining Ruud Hesp, Michael Reisiger and Winston Bogard, who were the Dutch contingent already at the club. To add to this home away from home feeling for Clivert, former Ajax teammates Ronald and Frank de Boer were acquired in the winter window. All this helped him to put the last two trying campaigns behind him and not only return to his best but reach a whole new level entirely. Clivert must have been an utter nightmare for La Liga defenders to come up against. He was a right handful, a bully who was so good at receiving the ball with his back to goal, using his exquisitely sticky first touch to control it, turn his man and then battering ram his way towards goal with an irresistible mix of skill, technique, strength and sheer determination. He was such an intelligent forward and his reading of the game coupled with his agility and magnificent movement meant he often got goal side of the defender or found himself in frankly far too much space and when in a position like that Clivert would rarely miss as my god did this man know how to find the back of the net when we talk about natural finishers in football I don't think there are many better examples than Patrick Clivert in his prime he ended the season as Barca's second top goal scorer with 16 in all competitions behind Rivaldo who got a phenomenal 29 speaking of that Brazilian legend him and Clivert shared a special footballing connection which was incredibly sparked pretty much as soon as they started playing together. They seemed to be immediately in sync with each other and this sporting telepathy led to a lot of goals because in addition to his own strikes, Clivert's clever runs, smart, accurate and varied passing and crossing as well as his physical presence in the box and strength in the air meant he chipped in with 14 league assists with a decent chunk of them being for Rivaldo. Barca were brilliant that season and they won La Liga by a very comfortable margin of 11 points. That would be the last silverware that Clivert would ever get his hands on, as the following season would see two of his rocks at Barca, Rivaldo and Van Hal at odds with each other, apparently falling out over the Brazilians playing position. The Dutch manager left Barcelona in 2000 and the club endured a dark and chaotic period. Clivert was one of the only reliable constants in that time, never scoring less than 15 league goals, as well as continuing to contribute a healthy amount of assists until his final season which, despite the arrival of Frank Rijkaard, with whom he had won the Champions League at Ajax, a knee injury saw him miss significant game time and managed to net just 8 league goals and 21 appearances, although to be fair, only 11 of those were starts. During this time, Clivert starred for the Netherlands at Euro 2000. He ended the tournament as joint top scorer with 5 goals, one each against Denmark and France as they topped their group and three in the 6-1 quarterfinal demolition of Yugoslavia. Clivert would once more be subjected to the cruel lottery of penalties and feel the sting of losing this way as they fell to Italy in the semis. In this match, Clivert actually had the chance to hand Holland the lead from the spot in normal time, but couldn't take it. He was released from Barcelona in the summer of 04, leaving behind a lasting legacy of 122 goals and 40 assists from 257 appearances in all competitions. Clivert joined Newcastle on a free, having been tempted by the opportunity to play alongside goal-scoring legend Alan Shearer as well as the atmosphere at St James's Park. Only 28 at the time, this was surely seen as a coup for Newcastle to obtain such a high profile player for free. Alas, it transpired that this was unfortunately a Patrick Clivert who had passed his best, and there are multiple potential reasons for this. After scoring twice in the UEFA Cup qualifiers, manager Graeme Souness pointed out he's got that much class, athleticism and ability that it can only be his state of mind which will prevent him from becoming the best striker in the world in the next four years. His knee was also bothering him, frequently swelling up in training. Clivert was also said to be an enjoyer of the famed Newcastle nightlife. The Dutch hitman got just 6 in the league, one behind joint top scorers Alan Shearer and Craig Bellamy as the Toon endured a dreadful campaign, ending up in 14th. He did score some important goals though, 5 in total in Europe as they made it to the quarters of the UEFA Cup and 2 vital strikes against Spurs and Chelsea on their run to the FA Cup semi-final. Newcastle decided not to take up the option of extending Clivert's contract and sad to say his career was all but done at this point. 
he would go on to have underwhelming one-year stints with Valencia, PSV, with whom he won the Eredivisie, and Lille respectively, before retiring in 2008. By that time, he had already stepped down from international duties and was the Netherlands' top scorer with 40 goals until Rowan van Persie overtook him in 2013. Of Kluivert's supreme talent and ability, there is no question. Famous for being a wonderful goal poacher and fox-in-the-box type player, he was really much more than that. Surprisingly swift, skillful and agile for a man of his size, Kluivert was capable of going past his opponent. His sublime first touch allowed him to pick balls from the sky and blast them home. He was a smart player, always looking to catch out defences with his devastating runs. He will go down as one of the very best headers of the ball of his generation. However, there were definitely question marks over his attitude, mentality and character. And despite getting his hands on three Dutch titles, a La Liga and the Champions League, there is a feeling that he was capable of achieving so much more. There are, I believe, several factors which led to this. Firstly, you get the sense of right place wrong time regarding his post Ajax club career. AC Milan were in a mess when he signed. He enjoyed one great year with Barca before they endured one of their longest barren spells of the modern era. Newcastle, who had been flying high in the table for three years, came spectacularly crashing down the season he arrived. Additionally, his knee issues, for which he had had his first of many surgeries before he was even 20, clearly had taken his toll on his performance so that by the time he was 28, he was pretty much gassed, lacking the explosive power which made him so dangerous in his prime, and his high-profile off-pitch scandals and activities soured relations with the press and the public at a few of his clubs, and clearly affected him on the park as well at times. But ultimately, for me, Clivert's tale seems to be one of someone who got too much too soon. Imagine achieving pretty much your wildest dreams and winning basically all that you ever wanted while still a teenager at the first time of asking. Not only was he the main character in that fairy tale story, he wrote the final lines in the page of that chapter of history. I can only guess at the psychological effect that that may have when further successes don't follow. 